I'm here with Larry Schover, Chief Investment Officer of SFG Alternatives, as well as my buddy Scotty Connor, Director of Trader Education here at TD Ameritrade. We're only about 597 people short of an OEX reunion in 1995. <laughs> yes, That's the last time all three of us were in the same place at the same time. The same pit, right? Exactly, <laughs> but, but it's great to, uh, great to have you guys here. And, uh, here. Hopefully we've got some great trading ideas after a big, big week this week. You know, Larry, what's the number one thing that stood out for you this week? A lot of energy was spent and we're only up 30 points on the week. I mean, I could overemphasize and talk uh, about- I thought that was a little pun on the crude. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of energy. I mean, considering uh, we're up 30 points on the week and the way yields moved back down and um, the issues we had with Europe and the low we made on Tuesday and bounced back. So I think to me, it was just stunning that, I mean, so much energy, but yet we did rally 30 points on the week in the S&Ps. Yeah, I mean, I think I think all in all, everybody would it would take it as yes. far as uh, what ended up happening with all, all the major indices. Yes. It, it's pretty good. Scott, sure. what, what do you look at? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things we had this week. Not only do we have a, a wild week, but you know, we wrapped the month up. And I think a lot of people mm. were looking at, at May as like, how are we going to finish May? It was not selling May and go away, was it? No, but we did mm -hmm. manage to, f to finish positive in all four indices yes. for, for May, right? Now, I think an interesting takeaway is that is people are watching sectors here a lot and seeing where money's moving in and out. And I think if you look at all of May and how we finished, you know, the S&P 500 Dow just barely finished uh, above even, mm -hmm. um, but strikingly different between what happened in, in the NASDAQ, mm -hmm. up about 5.5%, and then of course, who led May? Russell. The Russell up almost you know over six percent. Mm. So mm. kind of interesting what we've seen that this uh, sort of rotation into into the, these two groups sure. seems to be continuing. And well, I want to play off one of the things Scott just talked about, Larry, because when you look at the Nasdaq, particular, I'll come back to you in right. a in a second, Scott. But when you look at the Nasdaq, are you thinking tech's back, fangs back? You know, what are you seeing as mm. as you're looking out in terms of investments of where you think people should be looking? Should it be the chip maker? Should it be Fang itself? You know, what's the areas that's most interesting to you? With yeah. Now? Well, first of all, I look at the S and P 500, and I can't help but think about tech. And Amazon's in that group. Last five years, S and P 500 is up 82 percent compared to Eurostox 50, which is only up, I think, 50 percent. Mm -hmm. And the gap is mm -hmm. technology, largely followed by biotech, which is uh, S and P is full of that. So. Um, when I think of uh, the disparities, I watch all the indexes, including what's going on in Europe, right. that's where my uh, thesis happens to be. Um, I realize that the S&P 500, near and dear to my heart, but it is laden with technology. So uh, on Europe, you know, as you see, obviously somebody who follows it closely day to day, you saw all that went on this week. Should we be afraid of Europe, or do you think what happened at the end of this week, vote of confidence, mm -hmm should help earnings going forward, or would you go in saying, eh, guys, not so fast? I'd first say it's really hard to handicap politics. I think we so, all would agree right. with that. Yes. So handicapping it, really, yeah. right, <laughs> good luck, good luck. Um, but I think it continues to trade, Europe continues to trade at a discount. Um, I'm not saying all that bad information is baked into the market, but there's so many unknowns and moving pieces, but that said, um, the economic momentum is there, and I would focus on the consumer uh, in Europe, and I think the economy there is due for a bounce back, just like uh, what we're experiencing. I mean, we had a full, full court press of great data in the U.S. Yes. this past month, and so I don't think Europe's going to bounce back as quickly, but I think it is bouncing back. Mm -hmm. All right, and Scott, you know, speaking of that, many people have talked about the fact that Russell is many are using as a hedge against the rest of the world because so many of the stocks there operate domestically, if you will. And, and so when you, you, know, you talked about how great the Russell did, do you attribute it primarily to that fact or maybe because some of those stocks had been unloved earlier in this year? Uh, JJ, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, you know, we're seeing that rotation that we were just talking about. Uh, but again, what, what is some of the reason? Yeah, a little bit of a safe haven factor uh, because the U.S. homegrown stocks don't have exposure to some of the political things that are going on in Europe or, or the stronger dollar. It's more of an at-home thing. The tariffs don't hurt them as much either, potentially. So, yeah, I can understand why there's growth there. But I think it's both. You know, it's been sort of a, a neglected sector, and now it's gained some momentum. Uh, and I think another thing this week, uh, energy sector, kind of same thing. We saw oil, a terrible week in oil. Yeah. But yet some of the energy stocks 
didn't really move back down. You know, we saw rig move up four days in a row. And this is a producer of oil mm -hmm. while oil was dropping. So some really interesting dynamics this week. Well, it's interesting because Scott Nations and I just got to, and talking oh, about okay. the fact that XLE was up today, ExxonMobil was up today, crude oil down. Mm -hmm. So when you, Larry, you look at something like this, it just doesn't have to be energy. Mm. In the past when you've seen this happen, so we'll, we'll put it to energy since it's happening yeah. now. Do mm -hmm. you see this as maybe a sign that the selling's over, we're setting a bottom on, on the commodity itself, or do you say, no, not necessarily? And because one of the things we talked about was also the risk of investing in ETFs right. that they sure. don't always reflect what's going on with the commodity. Yeah, well, you know, I've been wrong about oil all year long. I've been <laughs> short it from January. It's been painful. I've made some of it back. Right. Um, and I, I, still, I still am of the conviction that we'll see $60 uh, a barrel oil in WTI right. by the end of the year. But um, given the deep discount that the typical oil company trades at compared to the rest of the market, mm -hmm. You know, valuation is like a much, much more uh, uh, reasonable. And what do, what do you attribute that to? That, the, that factor of, you know, actually, it was, it's almost counterintuitive. It's like when oil is getting Because I just want to clarify for people sure, watching. When sure. someone uses a term like that, I just want to make sure they understand yeah. why you would say deep discount. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think um, it's like when oil is getting above $70 a barrel, 75 around that area. Um, it's, it starts to hurt the oil companies in a way because demands go, they, they feel like if the forward curve, the demand in the future is going to go down, so therefore it's going to hurt their profit. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's counterintuitive. Oil down at 62 $65 a barrel is actually better for them because they're producing more. Well, I think one of the interesting things that people may not know when they look at a company like Exxon mm -hmm. is many of their contracts actually it's done by price. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how many mm -hmm. barrels they delivered, mm -hmm. if they delivered at $70, they'll just deliver less price, uh, le less, barrels less barrels than they would at oh, okay. $50. So that, that uh, to your point about being counterintuitive, and it's why understanding companies helps, knowing that about Exxon, you should know they're delivering less mm -hmm. it, it, for, for some of their contracts when they get hired. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, but, but, but I think you, you're yeah. bringing up a good point about what happens with some of these companies. And Scott, you <laughs> talked about rig and some of the producers. Yeah. What do you see for them? Is this, again, something that, are they going to be tied if crude does continue down? Or is, do you think that they're sort of saying, we think crude is, is set a bottom or at least uh, going right. to trade? Right, yeah, rate. exactly. I think that there was some encouragement for those who follow the, the, the oil stocks in that even though oil was down on the week, um, many of those stocks were not. So. And that's important because people have been watching the market and looking for leadership. You know, who other than tech can help lead this charge higher? We're, we got through a great earnings season. What's going to get us to the next level, right? How are we going to go back and test those highs from January? So people are looking at, you know, who's going to lead that charge? And we were looking at financials and energy. And they were kind of taking over there for a while. But, you know, to see oil dropping, that sort of put a, through a wrench in the work, so to speak. But, JJ, the, you just mentioned the stocks actually held in fairly well. So I think from a trader investor standpoint, that's a bit encouraging to see that these other groups can help tech. Because tech, I mean, look what happened today. Microsoft over 100 for the yeah. first time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, that to me is a, a real <laughs> benchmark. Facebook, number. Yeah. Facebook looked phenomenal during the week. Um, mm -hmm. So have yeah, Apple. they're there, yeah. but they but to get I think the whole market to that next level, they need help from a couple other sectors. Right, and so it's interesting. One of the uh, areas of the market that I thought was interesting by maybe its non-performance, besides you know we talked about gold earlier with Scott, is the VIX. You know, the VIX right. had a day where it looked like we might come out and play, but uh, overall. I, you know, are we back to where we're going to say, okay, the VIX is going to trade 12 for this year? Is VIX going to trade? You know, I think we're all of the same opinion that VIX is going to have some sort of range here. But what is that range that we're looking at? And do you see any catalyst coming up that will make that VIX pop and stay above 15? Okay. Well, first of all, we all know just from trading that um, volatility trades in regimes, right? right? It's like waves. and. Mm -hmm. It tends to lead what actually is happening, and, and the VIX is trading so much cheaper than all of us would expect right now, right? That said, we also know that the VIX really isn't a, the best measure of implied volatility. It's more of a measure of, you know, out of the money covers, out of the money put in the right. demand, and what we call the... And, and Larry's been on here quite a few times talking about this, and it's been great discussion. If you <laughs> want to go back in the archives, look what he and Russell Rhodes were on here. It was awesome. Yeah. Go ahead, Larry. <laughs> sure. So it's really like implied volatility skew. Um, but that said, 
um, after the after the devastating news on Tuesday, going into Wednesday, I was shocked mm -hmm. with how low mm -hmm. skew was. How the volatility service didn't really react, which means the implied volatility of 30 day versus 60 day versus 90 day, the whole term structure. Um, I scratched my head, but I've, I've scratched my head for 30 years, and so it, it, it's always one of those <laughs> things. You, you listen to it, and you just adhere to it. Like it, it's it's telling you something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, it, it, the strange thing is, it's been telling you not to be concerned right. recently. Said, and and maybe a lesson for many people as they look at their investments. Yeah. much of this is actually noise, particularly mm -hmm. if you're investing in a longer term. And Scott, you know, what, what what sort of your take on VIX right now? Um, well, I, I think we're still in a high higher volatility level than we were in 2017, and I don't really see us yep. going back to that. <laughs> number one, but you're absolutely right. The range of the jumps in VIX seems to be getting a little tighter. In other words, maybe the market is not getting as wound up about these geopolitical <laughs> events and they're just sort of taking a little more in stride. But look what happened on Tuesday. You know, that sell-off, mm -hmm. we t almost touched 19. We were 18.8, I think, right. on the VIX. Mm -hmm. Now we're 13. Very quickly, though. 13, yes. yeah, it was quickly and it down fairly quickly, mm -hmm. you're right. Um, but if you do believe that there's more to come and there could be more geopolitical events, you know, you could look at JJ as, as this is protect, potentially an entry point to say, hey, listen, if there's more VIX and there's more pop, maybe I'll go out 30 days or 60 days and say, you know what, maybe I'll I'll buy a VIX call spread here. And again, I'm just throwing out an example yeah. of what people do uh, when they think there might be a pop between now and the next 30 or 60 days. Keep 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 it defined risk, sure. maybe a 15, 18 call spread, something like that. And, and again, this is the kind of thing, or if you also believe that this is a low level and you're looking for an opportunity to perhaps hedge a portfolio, well, we know when VIX is low, options are relatively cheap, cheap. and this might be an opportune time to look at something mm -hmm. like that. All right, so one of the things I want to ask you about is, is we now let's look look forward. Right. To, personally, I, I, I said at the top of the show, this coming week is the type of week that scares me because we don't have a lot of earnings, or at least the manager companies, and we actually don't have a lot of numbers. So as we go into next week, Larry, what are you looking at? And any advice for you know the clients watching? Here we have a few of the things, factory orders, jolts, again. I don't see any number in there where I'm like, wow, I really need to focus on that one. Yeah. I don't know, is there anything you're really focused on coming up? Yeah, I, I guess you know, ISM's a big number, but it's just one number coming out next week. And I mean, the momentum for the week beginning June 13th continues to get larger and larger right. and larger. So the next week's almost gonna be you know, everybody's just going to wait, hurry up and wait for that to happen. But um, and the week of June thirteenth because of the Fed that, meeting you referred exactly to. and ECB and uh, et cetera. Um, but I think next week is a good time to reflect on the enormous amount of good numbers that we had last month. I mean, considering unemployment rate fifty year low, business personal business spending is on an absolute tear. The biggest bounce back, the biggest three month bounce back in like five years. Mm -hmm. Consumer confidence eighteen year high. I mean, we're in a good spot. I'm not saying that it's going to go on forever, but I think it's a good time to just like you know get your footings and realize that um, we've had some good momentum. Well, there is one number that comes out this week. I want your perspective on for sure. You know, with your expertise in Europe, and that is European GDP comes out on yep. Thursday. As you look at that, is there anything you think that's going to roll over to our markets, or, or do you think it's just going to be interesting data point? Hmm. Let's march on. Yeah, you know, it could. If, if it comes out um, much different than expected, and consensus is all over the map right. on that right now, so it's kind of tough. But I think what it will do is it'll definitely affect the euro. It'll affect the boond yield, and so by extension, it'll affect. It could affect our yield and the dollar, et cetera. It could actually stabilize the euro. Because I personally think the euro is going to be 122 by year end, not where it is today, based on a lot of factors. But I think um, that number, um, if it comes within consensus, would be okay. But off the charts, then we'll see some big fragments. Katie, bar the door. <laughs> yes. That's right. Scott, you have any one or next two week? quick things you're looking at coming up next week? Sure. I think you guys hit on something very important. Next week is the build into the FOMC week, right? Yes. So that's coming June yes. 13, 14. And it's kind of interesting because there's, there's no Fed speakers next week. Right. right. So they're mm -hmm. in a quiet period you know, before a meeting. Mm -hmm. They can't really talk much. So that might actually be refreshing for a while. <laughs> but um, I'm kind of looking at it is the numbers that are coming out next week 
are, this is the last chance the Fed's going to get to look at some numbers before that big June decision. Now, most people feel they're going to hike. Yeah, anyway. we're, we're near 100%. For sure. Yeah, yeah. But, but what's the language beyond that? So, you know, the jolts number next week. Well, okay, if that's a big surprise, that might be something the Fed looks at. I know. Yeah, but wasn't that a Janet Yellen it number? It was a Yellen I, number. Yeah, it I, was, I don't yeah. think, I don't think they're looking Yellen at number. that one anymore. Yeah, not as much. C certainly not. Um, but again, that's what I'm kind of looking at. If there's any big surprises, you know, what might that have on the Fed? But otherwise, JJ, like you said, I think it's kind of a quiet week. Um, let's watch and see what happens if the sector rotation continues. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are going to be watching that as well. All right. Awesome. Awesome discussion. I, I want to thank Larry, Larry Shover, Chief Investment Officer at SFG Alternatives, and as well as Scotty Connor Great for coming in today.